tapes until we have the recording fixed. <laughs> that would have been all right. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to tell you jokes for three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> No, good. So, so we're waiting. They're just fixing a technical problem. Ah, they actually give me a thumbs up that they're, that they're okay. So, um, let's start uh, recording broadcasting. And we have Pedro also for a thumbs up. Great. So, welcome to the European Space Astronomy Center here in Madrid as one of the establishments of ESA. My name is Markus Gustafatik. I'm the head of the Science and Operations Department. And it gives me an immense pleasure today to welcome Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who is our illustrious speaker for this afternoon. Um, and we have actually uh, the pleasure to welcome her today all day. She animated uh, discussions about pulses, about women in astronomy. Um, so we are very grateful to have profited from all this wisdom and knowledge so far. And um, she will give us now a talk and presentation about um, uh, women in astronomy today. Um, and I'm uh, here to introduce her, and uh, just a few quick words about her. Um, and quick words will not do justice to her, because obviously she has a fantastic career behind her. Um, but I thought I'd mention a few points, um, also inspiring, I think. Uh, she got a Bachelor of Science at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, and you will see that across her career she actually bounced back, although she is from originally Northern Ireland, as she just uh, confessed to me. Um, got a PhD from the University of Cambridge, and then um, had various stages at various universities, Southampton, University College London, Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, the Open University, University of Bath, and she's currently a visiting professor at the University of Oxford. She's also a chancellor at the University of Dundee. Um, so you see that she had many stages, typically spending five to 10 years at, at each of them. Um, she was rewarded with a long, long list of prizes, um, which I will not actually mention all here. Um, but a few actually uh, picked up my, uh, uh, my curiosity, namely uh, I mean, things like the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Grand Medaille of the French Academy of Science, so things obviously that uh, get uh, are very high rewarded. Um, the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, I think, um, and many others. Uh, but she was also actually uh, elevated to the commander of the Order of the British Empire in 1999 uh, and then made actually Dane commander of the Order of the British Empire later. So if you want to address her with her full titles, it will take you a little bit of uh, a while. All well deserved um, because, of course, she is uh, one of our references in science, uh, in, in astrophysics. Um, she, uh, the, the one uh, episode which I will not talk about, uh, and yet I'm doing, is that of course she was uh, uh, very lucky as a postgraduate student to actually discover radio pulses. Um, and then there was a later controversy, and that's what I'm not going to talk about. It's namely that discovery was awarded Nobel Prize in 74, and she was not among the recipients, um, but uh, a lot of that has been said and discussed, and here she, she herself has, I think, passed that episode, so I'm, uh, I'm not gonna mention it further. Um, so I think uh, Jocelyn uh, is probably an inspiration to us all, uh, both for her career, the work she did, uh, the modesty with which she approached it, uh, all the wisdom that she shared and keeps sharing reluctant, uh, relentlessly with, uh, with all the public, and so it's a great, great pleasure to have her here today and uh, address this subject. So please, Jocelyn, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a ver very great pleasure to be here, to have a face-to-face -face encounter with an audience, not the anonymity of Zoom and so on. Uh, much more fun for the speaker to have a real audience. So thank you for this opportunity. So I've been studying women in physics, women in astrophysics most of my life, and I'm going to talk a bit about that today. We fail at the first hurdle. Have I switched it on? It'd be switched on, shouldn't it? Aha, right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Caroline Herschel, who is one of the earliest women astronomers. But I'm going to talk mainly about data from the International Astronomical Union about women astronomers in membership of the International Astronomical Union. It's a very interesting database, and I think it gives us all some food for thought. So Caroline Herschel. She was born in Germany. 
As a child, she had typhus, and she never grew very tall, um, about one meter 20, if I remember rightly, so even smaller than I am. But never underrate a small woman. <laughs> um, she spent the perhaps most important years of her life in England. Her brother was William Herschel. Her nephew was John Herschel, both of whom you will know as astronomers. Um, born in Hanover, her, the men of her family were military musicians. Uh, Caroline was one of only two girls, and I think the other girl did not survive. And Caroline's destination was to be as some kind of servant or assistant to one of her brothers. She did not get a lot of education, but she got more education than her mother. She could read and write. Her mother could not read and write. And Caroline was her mother's amanuensis, reading things for her mother, writing things on behalf of her mother. Her destination was to be some kind of housekeeper or servant, probably to one of her brothers. Uh, as her father said, she was not pretty. She should not expect to marry. And indeed, she started her adult life as housekeeper stroke servant to one of her brothers in Germany. William, her elder brother, meanwhile, had moved to England. William was a musician, and he got a musician post in the city of Bath uh, in England. And he asked his brother in Germany if Caroline could come to England to be his servant. And the brother said, yes, provided he, William, pays the brother for the cost of a servant to replace Caroline. So she is some kind of goods that's being transacted. She comes to Bath. OK. Um, she comes to Bath. And maybe I say a little bit more about the bottom line. Back in Germany, when she was housekeeper to this brother, a really nasty character. Could she have uh, French lessons? No. Could she have music lessons? No. Could she have sewing, dressmaking lessons? Yes, provided everything she made was for him, not her. William negotiates that she comes to England to be his housekeeper. Come on. Right, and pays the brother for the cost of a servant. So she comes to Britain because she has a nice singing voice. And uh, when she first came to Britain, she did perform choral you know, pieces, things like that, the solo parts in choral pieces, provided William was the conductor. She would work with nobody else. And she lived with William and was his housekeeper. William was becoming interested in astronomy, and he started making mirrors for telescopes. I don't think he really understood how curved mirrors work. He would make a mirror, it was so-so. He'd make a mirror with a different shape, it was better. So he, you know, by experiment, got better and better mirrors. Caroline is complaining because every room in the house has a mirror in it being made. And once William gets polishing, he does not stop, day or night. And Caroline feeds him food, forkful by forkful, to keep him energized. And there is pitch, and all his cravats are spattered with pitch. So she's not a terribly happy person about this. This is the house they lived in. It's tiny. Uh, you can see the width of it. And all the big rooms had a big mirror being made. It's now the Herschel Museum. 
And if ever you go to Bath in the south of England, it's well worth a visit. It's, it's really interesting. This shows the back garden of the house. There is a plaque just here. This is it. Here lived scientist and musician, Sir William Herschel dates from where he discovered the planet Uranus, March 1781, and infrared radiation in 1800. And also his sister, Caroline Herschel, Hunter of Comets. William got good telescopes in the end. They had a very good observing system. The problem for optical observers is you need to keep your eyes dark adapted, but you also need to record your observations. They, the system was that William was out at the telescope in the dark, Caroline was nearby, with a small desk, a small lamp, and the notebook. William had a transit instrument, and as the star crossed the crosshairs, he would say, now! And Caroline read the clock and recorded the time. So he stayed dark adapted, and she did the recording. So she worked with William all night, doing astronomy. During the day, she wrote up the observations, prepared papers for publication, ran the house. She learnt trig trigonometry and calculus by asking William questions over breakfast, and somewhere she got a bit of sleep, perhaps, and then repeat the process. Occasionally, William had to be away, and he gave Caroline a small telescope of her own. It had a wide field of view, she already knew the night sky pretty well. Not good. Um, but she was preparing the things for publication. She, she knew the constellations. Um, she knew the catalogues as well. Uh, and so when William's away, she's using this small wide field camera, camera, <laughs> a telescope, and finds some comets. In the end, she found eight comets. But to begin with, of course, it's only one or two. Uh, they moved away from Bath at the request of the king, King George I, who was also from Hanover, was the British king. And he asked William and Caroline and their telescopes to come close to Windsor, where he lived. This was to help him entertain visitors. You know, sometimes you have visitors. What do we do with these visitors? What do we show them? Where do we take them? Well, when the king had visitors and he did not know what to do with them, he called for the coach and horses. The visitors and the king got into the coach. They went round to the Herschel's place and William Herschel showed them the telescopes. If William was away, Caroline showed them the telescopes. And it was clear that she knew as much about the telescopes as he did. And their visitor's book was fantastic. Like who's who. I don't know if there's a European equivalent of who's who. It's a biographical dictionary in Britain listing all the very important people. So their visitor's book has many, many important names in it. And while William is away traveling on business, Caroline uses the little telescope that he has made for her to look for comets. Um, yes, yeah, she put Flamsteed's catalog into declination order, which was helping them with their observing, for example. So she really, really knew. Uh, the king came to recognize her abilities and not only gave William a stipend, but also gave her a small stipend. She becomes the first female astronomer to earn some money. 
and in Britain, the first ever government employee, or the first female government employee. Wrong way, point it there. So these are actually photographs of Comet Hale-Bopp, um, which I think remains the most magnificent comet I've ever seen. But uh, Caroline found some good ones. Maybe I need to go nearer. It had new batteries. It should work. Yeah. It's okay. Don't worry. I can do it from here. So she lives a long life. She's 98 when she dies. And it's lucky that she lives that long because all her awards came late in life. She gets a gold medal from the Royal Astronomical Society when she's 78. She becomes an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society when she's 85. She and Mary Somerville were the first female members of the British Royal Astronomical Society. She becomes a member of the Royal Irish Academy at 87. And the King of Prussia, she moves back to Germany ultimately, the King of Prussia gives her a medal on her 96th birthday. <laughs> so she may be very tiny, but she was tough. So moving on then to women more recently and the International Astronomical Union. The International Astronomical Union, the IAU, as you probably know, is the world body for professional astronomers. You're put into membership by the professional astronomy body in the country where you work, not what your nationality is, where you work. So from here, it would be the, I don't know what it's called, the equivalent body here, but never mind. In uh, 1990, some women astronomers wrote to Derek McNally, who was then the General Secretary of the International Astronomical Union, um, concerned about the status of women in astronomy. Derek McNally was having nothing to do with this. He was keeping it well away. The International Astronomical Union regards itself as a body devoted to the promotion of astronomical sciences and to that extent has tried not to cross into matters of social concern. So women, few, many, not an issue for the IAU. A little bit later, we try again. Johannes Andersen, who died last year, a Danish man, was the general secretary of the IAU. Married to another astronomer, Birgitta Nordstrom. Johannes could see that he had no trouble getting an astronomy job in Denmark, but Birgitta had a lot of trouble. And he wondered if this was because she was a woman. And maybe something in Danish society was discriminating against women, because he felt she was a good astronomer, as good as he was. And he suddenly realized he had the answer to that question. He's the General Secretary of the International Astronomical Union. He holds the data on all the individual members of the International Astronomical Union. And he starts recording them with their gender. Only two genders, I'm afraid, only male and female. But better than amalgamating them. And so, from that period, the IAU has kept its membership divided into two genders. And it's that data that I have been following, and it's that data that I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk. So, some caveats. You have to be a tenured astronomer. You have to have the professional astronomy body in your country of work forward your name to the International Astronomical Union. 
If they do so, you are automatically a member of the International Astronomical Union. So in this room, I'm sorry we can't do it for online, but in this room, how many people here are members of the IAU? And, yep, we've got the gender balance issue again. Thank you very much. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yep. Um, in Britain, it's the Royal Astronomical Society that does this. And the Royal Astronomical Society has been rather lax, as you will see from the data. Uh, if you want to follow this up, this is the, the URL for uh, the data. I've tended on to focus on countries with a good number of astronomers. So a number of small countries I'm not talking about because I want the root N errors not to be overwhelming. So from 2020, countries with a large number of members ranked by their fraction of female. Um, Italy has come out best. 28% of its membership is female. France is also good, as is Brazil, Spain, and Russia is quite good. Well, Russia, women have always had to work in Russia. The world average is actually only 19%. Across the whole world, 19% of IAU members are female. It's not very big. And countries that are below the world average, the USA, at 17%. The USA is a huge country. About a quarter of the total membership of the IAU is USA. So it almost defines the average. And yet it's below the average. <laughs> Canada, a bit worse. India, okay, no surprise. China, Germany, no surprise. UK, more. Japan. Japan, no surprise. So that's where we are at the moment. And I can see some patterns that we will see as we go back in the years also. Southern Europe is better than Northern Europe for women in astronomy. And most of the English-speaking countries are below the world average. In fact, I think all of them still, yes. Um, Japan is not at all surprising. You know, women have not been professionally active in Japan. So I'll talk a little bit about what might be causing these patterns in a minute or two, but I'll go back through the years so as you can see some of the evolution. Um, I've been tracking this data for probably 20 years. I warn you, each slide here on in is in a slightly different format. Um, I haven't had the time to convert them all to the same format as this, but the principle is the same. Um, yeah, okay, you have to be nominated by your country's professional body. And I think I've probably said all this um, because some countries are, are good. I don't think it's anything to do with women's brains. I think what we're looking at is the culture in different countries. Um, only astrophysics has data collected this way. The professional maths and physics bodies do not collect gender segregated data, but I've been told by physicists and mathematicians that the patterns are really rather similar country by country. But this means this is a unique database. So what might explain these kinds of patterns around the world? Well, men. Men might decide that astronomy is not a prestigious subject, that it's better to be in engineering or business or something like that. And so they leave astronomy for the women in some countries. Or maybe it's to do with the problems of child minding and arrangements for child minding. Maybe you live in a country where your parents are still nearby. Maybe your parents will help with the child minding. Or maybe you live in a country where, in addition to professional folk like us, 
there are many poorer people and there are poorer women who would love a job in your house, looking after your house, your children, the cooking, the meals, the dishes, while you go to be a professional astronomer. So there are a number of possible explanations for these kinds of patterns. But we do see the same kind of pattern. Southern Europe, Southern America tends to be better for women in astronomy than does the Northern European and the English-speaking countries. But I'm guessing at the sociological reasons. So 2019, not very long ago, marginal change. The world average is 17%, whereas it's 19% now. Um, otherwise, really not a lot of difference in the list, um, except that the UK is actually a lot better, or was a lot better, than it is now. Um, the Netherlands is another interesting one to watch. If I go back a couple of slides to the present, look where the Netherlands is. The Netherlands has had a campaign to recruit more women to science, and for a limited period, they were allowed to recruit women only. And that has clearly made quite a difference. Going back a bit earlier still, 2010, the world average here is just 15%. I think now I'm looking at countries with more than 100 members. The other two slides were 200 members. But going back in time, every country's membership is smaller. The membership of the IAU was smaller. So I've dropped the limit to 100. India has obviously risen in recent years. It was doing rather poorly in this list. Uh, Netherlands, I've already mentioned, they've done remarkably well. The English-speaking countries are still in much the same place. Um, again, it's southern uh, Europe and southern America that's remarkable. And if I go back. Two thousand and five. Again, the limit is now down to fifty members. So the root N errors will be quite a bit bigger. Argentina still heads the list. Japan is still bottom of the list. Um, India is low down. Switzerland, Germany, remarkably low down. Um, I've lost the average. I don't think I've printed it on somebody. Okay. To the left, yep, IAU average here. Thank you very much, in here. So we see the average going up over the years. Um, we see some countries go up and down. Um, we <laughs> see Britain steadily drop, which is really disappointing. So looking at the, the UK membership, because I was berating the Royal Astronomical Society for this. So in 2005, we were 10% female. Sorry. Of the, uh, of the UK IAU members, 10% were female. You have to make your sentences very carefully constructed when you do this kind of work. Um, by 2011, 12, 2018, 13. Yep, there was a change between 2018 and 2020 because the IAU has introduced a junior membership. And not all the data separates out the junior and the, the more senior. Sometimes they are amalgamated and I can't tell. But uh, it's clear that having a lot of younger members has increased the fraction of women remarkably, or put differently. Most of the women are young. Uh, so there was that change in between these two. But I think the UK is pretty pathetic. And it doesn't seem inclined to do anything about it, which actually annoys me even more. So, yeah, in 2016, we were better than a whole list of countries. In 2018, we're better than 
four countries. In 2020, we're better than Japan. In 2021, we're better than Japan. Full stop. And that is largely because the Royal Astronomical Society, which is the body that puts us into membership of the IAU, has not been watching, has not taken care. So I don't know what the professional body here would be, but because you work here, it's this country's professional body that puts you into membership or not of the IAU. I take heart from some work done in the USA by some business consultants, a company called McKinsey and Co. And McKinsey did some work on what companies were most successful. And they looked at the gender balance, particularly in the more senior parts of those countries. And they looked, I think, in general at diversity. So probably also being USA racial diversity um, in the senior management in those companies. And it became very clear to them that companies which were more diverse were more robust, more flexible, and more successful. Now, those of you who've held or hold management roles will know that the easiest group to manage is a group of people exactly like yourself. Um, it's never easy, that, but it's easier than having a diverse group. But actually, if you can do it, having a diverse group, racially diverse, gender diverse, diverse in every dimension of diversity, the more diverse it is, the more successful a group you're going to be, unless you have a really bad manager. <laughs> and I find this really reassuring because it's what my instinct tells me, having worked in quite a few areas. And if a major US management consultant is saying this, I think it probably extrapolates to astronomy I don't think it's just true of the business world, because the business world itself is already pretty diverse. So that's my resume of women in science. Um, a few other reflections um, from my own experience as being a manager in academia and research labs. Uh, it needs to be fairly transparent. It obviously needs to be well managed, well publicized. Um, a really important issue is childcare facilities. I don't know what the situation is here, but in British universities, uh, there is some childcare provision, but it's about 10% of what the university actually needs. And the other 90% of families are looking elsewhere for childcare facilities. Um, there are increasingly attempts to count how many female seminar speakers we have, how many male, what's the ratio, is it okay? Um, we watch recruitment. We've made a real mess in Oxford with our recent intake of grad students. We're taking in, I think it's eight new grad students and they're all male. It just sort of happened because we weren't maybe paying attention or looking overall at the picture. It was done on an individual basis. And uh, increasingly having somebody responsible for diversity is, is very, very useful. It's never very nice for the person because they're yelling at management, you know, your last 10 hires have all been men, what the hell are you doing kind of thing. And it's not very comfortable for management. But to have somebody who has responsibility for watching diversity, and it's somebody who is a peer, it's not somebody in the admin who maybe we don't treat with enough respect. It's somebody like us watching the data. But your job is often to yell at somebody. So it's not a terribly nice job. Um, and it's not just for recruitment of staff, actually. The same thing applies for recruitment at all sorts of levels. Um, postgraduates, undergraduates, researchers, academics, 
um, it's, the issue is actually really quite widespread. So I've been, as maybe you've already deduced, hammering on about this sort of issue for quite a long time. And I have gradually seen the number improve. And I've been part of a scheme, or helped create a scheme, that's actually made a huge difference. Um, it's called Athena Swan, and I'd be happy to talk about that if, if anybody wants to. But I've been watching this, and the data has gradually improved. It's not good, but it's getting better. Now, is that a superficial change? Is that like enabling ivy to grow up a wall, but the wall underneath hasn't changed? I don't know but I worry about that slightly. Has the structure changed? This is something that concerns me hugely in Britain. These are words used by advertisers to describe toys for children in Britain. You probably don't need me to tell you which are for boys and which are for girls. And this is the one that really worries me. Look how passive it is. Glitter, dress, princess, silky, hair, friends, okay. Oh, there's fun in there, all right. Beautiful, cuddly. My God, what are we bringing up our young girls to be? They may not recognize that there's advertising pressure on them. Their parents should, but I'm not sure their parents do. And actually, is this the type of masculinity we really want? Battle, control, evil, blast, weapons, shoot, shooting, boom. Oh, dear. What kind of society are the advertisers creating? Is that what we want? And although we can say bravely, we take no notice of the adverts, the children and the children's peers will be. They'll come under enormous pressure at school to conform to this kind of thing. How do we get any women to do science in the face of that? <laughs> so, perceptions have changed. Back in 1930, an earl not the most intelligent of people, this one, decided to say what the world would be like in a hundred years' time. In 2030, women will still, by their wit and charm, charm, inspire the most able men towards heights that they themselves could never achieve. Some surveys in the USA, in 1946 in the USA, 65% of people thought that men were smarter than women. By 2018, that was 86% thought men and women were equally smart. So there's been some change, but by Jove, we've, well, we've come quite a journey. But we do have a bit more of a journey still, I'm afraid. Um, we're, we're not there yet, but I do recognize that a lot of countries are now concerned and are trying to do things. And if you're interested, I can talk a little bit about what we've done in Britain the Athena Swan project, um, which has spread to Ireland, to Canada, to Australia, and is coming into the USA also with race bound into it as well. And the IAU itself, well, 100 years old, and for the first time in 100 years, we've just had a female president, and we've also had the first female secretary. They've both now recently demitted office, but at least the IAU itself has given women some um, title, if not power. So thank you for your patience with this harangue. Um, if there are questions or comments, um, I'd be delighted to hear a bit. Thank you.
Thank you very much for these inspiring words um, and for reminding us that there's a long road ahead of us. Uh, and uh, we're going to take some questions. Um, do we have also questions from online attendees or not? Not yet. So we're going to start with questions in the room and I see one hand up and I can actually run back with my microphone. Um, and this is recorded for everybody, right? So you, um, I need to tell you that for legal reasons. In, in case you don't want to be recorded, don't ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My name is Norbert Schattel, and I have not a question. I have two comments. You look to this membership on, on a very top level, in principle, professional astronomers. Yes. I think much more important is the questions, where starts the difference? Starts it in the kindergarten in Japan? Mm -hmm. It's a school, it's a university. If only 70% of the Japanese astronomers are females, then it's fine. But where starts the difference? Mm -hmm. And the second point, we have a lot of comments from the US, UK. But would it not be also a very important point to look to Spain, to Italy, and ask what is their difference? Yes what we can learn from them yeah. and not trying to bring the American approach to Spain, which is much, much better. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, I think in Britain, the difference starts with quite small children, with the toys that are available for small children. The boys get given guns, the girls get given dolls. And it continues. Sorry? Maybe. I don't know. I think in Britain, the advertising is very gendered, very different for girls and boys. So my hunch is that it starts with quite small children. Okay, one more question here. Yes, Jan Ubenes. Um, regarding the, to the toys and the commercial, I wonder about the hen and the egg. <laughs> Commercials essentially, I mean, they're sometimes considered a measure of a mirror of society, society. because they want to sell their products. Yes. So the question is whether society shapes the commercials or the commercials shape the society. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I just want to bring this in, this thought, yes. whether society is already this way and the commercial are just doing what people want and what is the influence of there may be no answer it might just be a comment but just something to keep in mind that it may be a you know an interaction between these two elements my hunch is that the commercial exaggerates what is already there and reinforces it and maybe develops it more So there's a question online that we should take? Okay, so let's take questions online, but uh, remember who's there. Do you want to read them up? Yes. The, uh, one of the questions is from Ana Victoria Ladeira. Uh, the Nobel Prize this year received a lot of backlash for the lack of diversity. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest can be done at that level of science recognition to foster diversity? Yeah, I think there are two separate issues here. One is about the pool of possible candidates, and the other is about the behavior of the Nobel Committee. I think the pool of possible candidates is limited to men. <laughs> but I think also that's not the only effect. I think also the Nobel Committee has not yet been sensitized, maybe is not aware that it might be gender blind, gender biased, when it needs to be gender blind. But also to be fair to the committee, Nobel Prizes tend to be for the very senior people um, who are of a senior generation when the situation was rather different. So if the Nobel Committee changes in the next 10 years, that hypothesis will be proved true. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> if, if I might a comment to this, I mean, there's a lot of research which showed that if you diversify actually your committees, you yes. actually diversify the recipients. 
And I think then the advice I think to the Nobel Prize Committee would be to diversify, which they're trying. Uh, they're not. They're not completely. Uh, they're, they're not uh, from behind the moon either. But Do you have other questions? Uh, can I just come back on on that point? Diversifying your committee does not mean having one woman on the committee, <laughs> which is what they have had from time. It should be 50-50. In fact, there's, there's even research that shows that if you have a single woman on, you stand to actually hire even less women. Oh. Because you have the... So, it's a very, so, so there are lots of... Everybody did lots of statistics on this. But then you have the excuse that you had actually no excuses, and then you fall back into old patterns. But uh, let's take uh, more questions. Yeah. Another question from Alba Vidal. The data from IAU shows a 2% increase in the last two years. Given that we are at 20% level, mean, we would need 15 years to reach equity, mm -hmm. and it's overwhelming. How can we speed it up? In the United States, there's been some experimentation with what they call double-blind uh, project proposal assessment. Sorry, that's a complicated sense. You propose for time on a satellite. Your name, um, probably your institution, is on a separate sheet that gets detached from your application. And actually the refereeing, the identity of the referee is also separated. So you do not know the gender of the applicant or the referee. And that seems to improve the fraction of women who get time. So that's an interesting development which now is being tried more in more places. It's called double blind. Okay, we're gonna take a couple of questions in the room and then go back to the questions online. So I had one here, one there, and one there. Oh, okay, no, plenty of hands. Your comments reminded me of an experience that um, back in the 1980s, whilst I was doing my master's degree, I was a teacher in an orderly secondary school in Kent in England. And uh, I kept in contact with some of my pupils afterwards. And I remember that some, one of my star pupils wrote to me a year or so later after I started uh, working on my PhD and, and said to me that she'd been to a science fair and a careers fair. And uh, her impression was everything about it was trying to persuade her not to pursue a career in science. Uh, I, I've, your comments made me think back to that remark. This was a person who, even 13 years old, really looked to have all the makings of being an excellent scientist. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the pressure is not so subtle. Um, I remember uh, staffing an exhibit in Guildford Cathedral. This was from the time when I worked at Mullard Space Science Laboratory on the Aerial 5 satellite, and we had a display. It was a science festival or something, and, you know, lots of rockets and satellites. And a group of small children, primary school, under 11, came with a woman, maybe a teacher, maybe a parent, and as we walked past, some of the kids spotted the display. Oh, space! And they all rushed to get leaflets. And the woman in charge said, now, now, if you all take leaflets, there won't be any for anybody else, perhaps only the boys. And that was with a woman staffing the exhibit. Hi, uh, I'm Patricia Cruz. Um, you showed a... a evolution of the um, IAU members from the, well, female from the, the mm -hmm. UK, right, over the years. And you said that there is a difference in number when the IAU um, starting admitting uh, junior members, right? Yes. So yeah. Did you check if this number continues increasing if you only check the senior members? My question is in the sense that I know that um, there are a lot of efforts in trying to get uh, women uh, pursued careers in astronomy and, and STEM um, in general. But the thing is that these uh, women, they don't get to higher levels. I yeah. mean, yeah. In, I think that the Spanish um, Astronomical Society did some um, research on this and showed some numbers that uh, when you're um, 
recruiting for a permanent position, mm -hmm. the number decreases. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you did that experiment. I mean, just yeah. uh, trying to see if the, this is a pattern. I can't do that because the IAU has, um, in, in the public available data, the IAU has amalgamated the junior and the senior members. So um, you can look at the age distributions of the male members and the female members, and the age distribution of female members peaks at about 35 or 40. So I think the junior membership has got a lot of young women, but that is a deduction. I don't actually have the data. Hi, I'm Eva Villaver, and along the same uh, comment uh, that Patricia made, uh, I'm from a country where uh, the percentage is perceived as pretty good, 22%. But I think it's very sad that, uh, that we perceive a 22% of yeah. professional astronomers in science yes. when we know that uh, in the undergrad level and in the grad level, the numbers are much higher. Mm -hmm. So we are losing women, and we are yes. losing them at a very high rate. Yes. And we don't have policies that are uh, strong enough that, uh, that provide uh, retention, that provide uh, answers to why we are losing women at such mm -hmm. a high rate when we actually have them, as, uh, yeah. despite all the, uh, all the advertisement, despite all the uh, society telling us that we shouldn't pursue a career in science, we are getting them mm -hmm. in Southern Europe. Mm -hmm. but we cannot keep them. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, you have any insight of uh, what can we do. And, uh I can only guess at the reason, and my guess is to do with having children and how you manage a career and children, uh, which I think is a number of us have tried and it's quite hard. <laughs> so that may cause the loss. But also there is a human tendency that when you recruit, you recruit somebody that looks like you. And since the majority of astronomers are male, there will be a natural tendency to recruit male rather than female, which you have to work very hard to counteract that tendency. Hello, I'm Anna. Um, I would like to allude to the recruiting process that you mentioned. Some might argue, and I think that quite a bit of people, that, well, only boys were accepted because it's on the basis of merit, and they were just simply more intelligent. So how do you counter this? Uh, and especially with the fact that a lot of people don't consider emotional intelligence as yeah. intelligence, yeah. and sometimes it might be stronger for some women. Yes. Yeah, um, I, I have a bit of an answer, but it's not a total answer. In Britain, a small group of women scientists of my generation became concerned that there were so few women professors, senior lecturers in university science departments. And we wondered what we could do about this. And one of us had a good idea. The head of a British university is called a vice chancellor in Britain. Maybe you know it as a president or something like that. Okay. So th this woman who had a bright idea said, you know, presidents are competitive people. If we create a prize for the most woman-friendly university, they will compete. Well, we were a group of women scientists. We did not have much money but we could buy a glass rose bowl. So we bought a glass rose bowl and we announced this competition. And initially, maybe eight universities competed. And we picked the best and we gave the rose bowl. We did it again the next year, more universities. We present the rose bowl. And that gradually evolved into a scheme, it was called Athena Swan, and the funding, the research funding bodies began to take an interest. Well, so did all the funding bodies. And they began to say, you must hold an Athena Swan award to prove that you are woman friendly 
before you can apply for our money. And wow, suddenly the men in the universities took notice <laughs> and things began to change quite fast. So the Athena Swan scheme has produced a big change. It spread from sciences to arts and humanities, where the question is, where are the men, not where are the women? It spread to um, Australia, to Ireland, to Canada, and it's now coming in in the United States, where it's not only gender, but also color. Um, and these schemes do seem to be making a difference. It's funding, it's the funders, the people who hold the money, who can force the change. It has some unfortunate spin-offs. Uh, a lot in Britain, a lot of postdoc young women are getting interviews for jobs because they want to say, we interviewed the same number of men and women, but we gave the job to a man. So there are a number of women postdocs who are getting interview after interview after interview, and they feel they are there to make up the Athena Swan numbers, not because they might get the job. So it's not perfect, but it has made quite a big difference in Britain. All right, so uh, we have a cutoff at four o'clock. We're going to um, take one more question online, and then we're going to end this session. Um, for everybody who's actually present on site, there's an event afterwards. Um, so I'm here giving the floor for one online question. <laughs> yes, and sorry for the, there are many questions online, but we cannot uh, answer all of them. I, I will take this one, which I think is, a, is an interesting one, from Marina Ruiz Garcia. Do you think the fact that girls don't know many female reference has some effect on the lack of women in astronomy or science in general? And do you think this gender gap would change if we talk more about female reference to children at schools, for example? Mm -hmm. I think it's not just the children, it's also the parents and the teachers, anybody who interacts with children. Um, but I think the point is very, very correct, yes. Um, so more visibility will help. So posters around schools about women in science or men in arts <laughs> would make a big difference. Yeah. Good. We have to end up here. So thank you very much, Jocelyn, for these inspiring words, for actually all the questions. Answer patiently. Thank you very much to all the online audience. Thank you very much for joining us here. Um, and uh, we'll broadcast another time on similar subjects. Thank you. So, Pedro, the, the next session where is